Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, the what, why and how of newspaper analysis from the perspective of civil services examination. Today we have taken up Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 3rd of April 2023. The articles that we are going to take up have been displayed on the screen. And let us now begin the discussion. So the first news that we have taken has appeared on regional page. Lok Ayukt case against Kerala CM likely to come up during the third week of April. So the Lokayukt case against Kerala Chief Minister on allegations of nepotism and favoritism may come up before the full bench during the third week of April. Now this bench will be a Lokayukt bench and not the Lokpal bench. And so you can clearly see that the case against the Chief Minister has been brought against the state ombudsman. From time to time, the issues related to Lokpal as well as Lokayukt appear in the newspaper frequently and we have found out that in recent past, we have not covered either Lokpal or Lokayukt. But it is very very important for us to cover these topics. Because if you look at the syllabus of GS Paper 2, we have statutory, regulatory and various quasi-judicial bodies as a part of a syllabus. Apart from that, under the governance part, important aspects of governance, transparency and accountability. Transparency, accountability and institutional and other measures are a part of your syllabus. And if you look at why the Lokpal and Lokayukt Act 2013 was formed, you can clearly see that it directly correlates with the syllabus. Although it is not directly mentioned there. Because if you remember under the leadership of social activist Anna Hazare, thousands of people across the country stage impassioned protests and demonstrations, all echoing the demand for a watchdog authority, an ombudsman body called Lokpal, to fight rampant corruption in the echelons of power. The Anna Hazare movement nearly brought India to a standstill for several months in 2011 and created enough pressure to force the Manmohan Singh-led UPA government to pass Lokpal and Lokayukta Act 2013. And of course, it took another six years for NDA government to appoint India's first anti-corruption watchdog in 2019. However, four years since the Lokpal was set up with such fanfare, not only has it failed to live up to expectations, even the hype around it seems unjustified, begging the question whether it was such a great idea to begin with. Because according to the statistics available on Lokpal website, a majority of the complaints so far have been frivolous or outside the jurisdiction of ombudsman. There has also been a sharp decline in the number of complaints, even frivolous ones over the years. And just few complaints were lodged in first one year of the commencement of the Lokpal and so in this regard it is important for us to understand what was the need to set up Lokpal because we have so many anti-corruption agencies we have CBI we have Central Vigilance Commission we have anti-corruption bureaus in the state and so Lokpal was set up so there must have been some deficit in the corruption management in our country that's why we needed an independent statutory body then what are the salient features of the Lokpal and Lokayukta Act what are the benefits that we gained from it and what are the challenges that it still faces? Let us now begin the discussion. So we'll begin by first understanding the meaning of the name Lokpal itself. So if you look at the word Lokpal itself, it has come from two words which trace their origin in Sanskrit. Lok and Pal. Lok obviously most of us understand means people. Whereas Pal mean protector or caretaker. So together Lokpal would mean the protector of the people. The aim of such an institution is to eradicate corruption at all levels of Indian polity. And we know that for a nation to develop, it needs to have an extremely well organized and meticulously planned such organization. Because we should understand that Failure of administration to curb the correction reflects on its growth. And the biggest reason for the failure of administration can be attributed to the ills of corruption. And if you look at the state of administration overall in our country, there are several deficiencies in our anti-corruption system, because of which, despite overwhelming evidence against the corruption, no honest investigation and prosecution takes place and the corrupt are hardly punished. And so when we have to talk about why is there an independent institution needed to check the corruption, 
we have to first understand that there are a lot of deficiencies in our anti-corruption mechanisms because of which despite overwhelming evidence against the corrupt there is a stark lack of investigation and since investigation is not independent and unbiased there is barely any prosecution in matters related to corruption and so most of our agencies like central bureau of investigation which has been called as caged parished by supreme court state vigilance departments internal vigilance wings of various departments anti corruption branch of state police are not independent ultimately all of them are under the direct control of the executive and when the cases are brought against people belonging to the ruling party or the officers favored by the ruling party cases are usually not taken up or the investigation is usually hushed up and so in most cases they have to report to the same people who are either themselves accused or are likely to be influenced by the accused and so most of the cases taken up by these agencies are usually against the members of the opposition party apart from that some bodies like central vigilance commission and lokayuktas or the state ombudsman which are created under the state laws they are independent but they do not have any power they are powerless organizations they have been rendered into just advisory bodies they can conduct their investigations but whatever the reports they submit are not binding on the state government they give two kinds of advice to the governments to either impose departmental penalties on any officer or to prosecute him in court and the experience shows that whenever the advice is tendered by a state lokayukt to the state government the advice is not usually followed apart from that if you look at it there is a clear cut lack of transparency and internal accountability presently there is not any separate and effective mechanism to check if the staff of these anti corruption agencies turned corrupt that is why despite so many agencies corrupt people rarely go to jail and in fact corruption has become a high profit zero risk business and so there is absolutely no deterrence against corruption and hence a need was felt to create lokpal at the central level and lokayuktas in all the states through a proper legislation which came in year 2013 after the protests spearheaded by india against corruption and so it is important for us to understand few basic concepts related to the lokpal act 2013 first and foremost the institutional mechanism itself and so the act has established lokpal for the union and the lokayukt for states to inquire into allegations of corruption against public functionaries and it is important at the same time to look into the composition of lokpal because it's not that intuitive and so according to the act the lokpal will consist of chairperson and a maximum of 8 members so in total there would be 8 members of which 50% of the member should be judicial members and at any point of time the 50% of member should come from sc st obc minority and women so this is the condition that has been implemented through the lokpal act 2013 apart from that its appointment procedure is also very unique because it involves two stages the stage 1 involves search committee which recommends a panel of names to the high power selection committee and this high power selection committee comprises of very unique combination prime minister speaker of lok sabha leader of opposition chief justice of india and an eminent jurist nominated by the president based on the recommendation of other members of the panel so you can see that the selection committee consists of five members who will decide on the final name of the people to be appointed here on the basis of the names submitted to them by the search committee and so you can see and ultimately the final selection shall be done and ultimately the appointment shall be done by the president of india 
So the final notification shall come from president. Now, as far as the jurisdiction is concerned, this is the most important aspect of Lokpal. The jurisdiction of Lokpal extends to anyone who is or has been the Prime Minister of India or Minister in the central government or the member of parliament as well as all officials of the union government under group A, B, C as well as D. So you can see that almost everyone belonging to the executive branch as well as the legislative branch of the uh, union government comes under the purview of the Lokpal. Of course, some level of immunity has been provided for the Prime Minister. Now there is not a complete exemption, there is a partial exemption which has been given to the Prime Minister because it does not allow a Lokpal inquiry if the allegation against the Prime Minister relates to either the matters related to international relation, external or internal security, public order, atomic energy or space technology. So you can see that important critical matters on which the discretion and the secrecy of this step is of utmost important has been kept out of the purview of the Lokpal. So if there is an allegation against the Prime Minister, for example, let's say relating to the licensing of a, a coal block, then Prime Minister is within the purview of Lokpal. But if there is allocation of fund for, let's say, research and analysis wing, or for that matter, funding of uh, diplomats for carrying out certain activities in USA, that is outside the purview of the allegations against corruptions, which can be looked under or by the Lokpal. But apart from that, even in these matters, even when the Lokpal has the power to try Prime Minister, then also there is a very, very important aspect that you should keep in mind. Apart from that, one very important aspect that you should keep in mind that although Prime Minister is exempted from the purview of Lokpal in certain matters and under certain matters and under the rest of the matters, Lokpal can try Prime Minister, but when Lokpal has to try Prime Minister, that probe cannot be taken up unless the full Lokpal bench considers the initiation of inquiry and at least two third, at least two third of the members of Lokpal approve of it. So for example, let's say if Lokpal at one point has complete eight members. So eight into two by three at least approved by at least six members. So even in those matters in which Prime Minister can be tried by Lokpal, it has to be approved by two third, at least two third of the members of Lokpal. And of course, such an inquiry against the Prime Minister is to be held in camera. And if Lokpal comes to the conclusion that the complaint deserves to be dismissed, the records of the inquiry are not to be published or even made available to anyone. Now, when it comes to the powers with respect to CBI or Central Bureau of Investigation, this has been one of the most contentious issues of our investigating wing. And so the power of superintendence and direction over any investigation including those investigations conducted by CBI itself for cases referred to them by Lokpal shall be vested with Lokpal. So let's say that there is a case of corruption against a union minister and CBI has been given the responsibility to conduct that investigation and that case has been initiated by the Lokpal. Now in that particular matter, who are the officers who will do the job? What are the kinds of evidences that are going to be looked into? How the chart sheet is going to be filed? For all those matters relating to that particular case, CBI will work under the superintendence of Lokpal and this has been provided to give some level of independence to CBI. And so the provision for confiscation of property has been provided that incorporates provisions for attachment and confiscation of property acquired by corrupt means even while prosecution is pending. And this is a big, big power which has been given to the Lokpal. So having looked at the need for Lokpal as well as the main provisions, we can easily derive the benefits of Lokpal as well. We can clearly see that it has very, very wide jurisdiction because it includes everyone, including the prime minister. And so 
Apart from that, it empowers citizens to complain to the Lokpal against corruption by public officials, and hence Lokpal will emerge as a powerful tool for citizens to hold their authorities accountable. Apart from that, it is also applicable to public servants who are not in India, who are serving India from outside, and so it indicates the extraterritorial nature of the jurisdiction of Lokpal. Since the special courts will be set with clear-cut timelines for the disposal of the cases, we can see clearly that the cases will be resolved in time-bound manner. Also, the provisions have been provided for punishing anyone for filing false complaints. And so any kind of frivolous or vexatious complaint will ensure that Lokpal is not misused for political gains or to settle other scores. And also, since the Lokpal can issue directions to agencies in India like CBI, CVC uh, while investigating and prosecuting cases under the direction of Lokpal, and this will ensure independent functioning or free functioning of these agencies from the government interference. But even th such an important act is not beyond criticism. Because first and foremost, you should see that there is a requirement of government approval. That does not vest power for prior sanction with Lokpal for inquiry and investigation of government officials. And so what is the use of creating such a powerful and so-called independent institution where in order to carry out investigation against a government servant, approval is needed. Apart from that, there is a time frame limitation also because the act envisages that the Lokpal shall not inquire into any complaint made after seven years from the date on which the offense has been committed. Now this restricts the scope especially in relation to some of the large and complex scams that are exposed from time to time. There are a lot of scams which see the light a decade after they were committed. There are financial irregularities uh, when they were being committed, no one actually pay, uh, paid uh, heed to them but few years later they come to limelight but the power has been taken away from Lokpal if the commitment of the crime was seven years prior to the complaint date and that is a big problem. Apart from that, Lokpal has been deprived of the authority of taking suo motu cognizance of the cases of corruption and maladministration. Suomoto means on its own. So let's say the members of Lokpal read a newspaper in the Hindu where it, it has published some irregularity in the administration of some scheme and involvement of minister. Now they would even if they want to take up that particular scam and investigate it, they do not have power unless and until there is a complaint against it, which is why we say that there is a lack of Suomotu powers. It always has to base its investigation only after a complaint has been filed. Apart from that, this is just for Lokpal, but if you look at Lokayukta, state legislatures are free to determine the powers jurisdiction of the Lokpal of their respective states and that has become a big problem because just like local government and the power which is being delegated to the local government varies from state to state since the Lokpal and Lokayukta Act gives the power to the state legislatures to enact their own Lokayukta with specific powers this will always mean that not all Lokayukta in our country are equally powerful. So the next news article that we have taken has appeared on front page. A cattle van driver found dead after assault by cow vigilantes near Bangalore. And so a murder case was registered late on Saturday night against a group of self-styled cow vigilantes who allegedly tortured and killed a 39-year-old assistant driver of a van transporting cattle on the outskirts of Bangalore early this morning. And this is nothing but a case of mob lynching, a form of violence in which mob or a group of people under the garb of administering justice without trial execute a presumed offender. And if you look at last five to seven years, the cases of mob lynching has just, and if you look at these kinds of instances in past five to ten years, these cases have just risen up. There have been uh, cases of WhatsApp lynchings where the mob or a people where a group of people in particular village were aroused because of news 
or WhatsApp forwards which claimed that people have come in their villages for child abduction or organ harvesting. Then of course case of Pehlu Khan, Tabrez Anzari related to cow vigilantism. No one can forget Dimapur mob lynching of 2015 where a mob of about 7,000 to 8,000 people broke into a prison, dragged a man detained under suspicion of rape out of Dimapur central jail, paraded him naked and beat him to death in case of vigilant justice. And so of course it is important from the perspective of our UPSC civil services examination because first and foremost you should realize that there is a particular pattern in which most of the cases are happening. Apart from all the ills that a mob lynching event creates, it also creates fractures in the society which then is utilized by external state and non-state actors to further widen that fissure. And hence it is important for us to understand it from the perspective of internal security. So we'll first understand what mob lynching is, what are its causes, what are its impacts and what steps have been taken to curb the menace of mob lynching. And so let us begin by first understanding what exactly is mob lynching. And so mob lynching is basically a form of violence in which mob, which means a group of people gather at a place under the pretext of administering justice without trial. And they execute a presumed offender often after inflicting torture and corporal mutilation. And so it is a sheer violation of the principle of rule of law. It's just the lack of order. People taking hands in their law is not what we desire as a society. And it is exactly because of this such an elaborate system of criminal jurisprudence have been created, police has been created, independent judiciary has been created. But still we are seeing increasing number of such instances where a group of people which basically are faceless mob, they gather at a place and they immediately administer justice which is mostly or usually in the form of death. And it is extremely problematic these inst because instances like this first and foremost deter India's image in international arena. Image of India as a democracy is extremely tarnished because of such instance and hence it spreads a very negative image for the Indian society and state that India is not able to protect the life and liberty of its citizens. Because after all, Article 21 says that life and liberty of a person can be taken away only by procedure established by law. And here the people are openly killing other people without any fear of law. Apart from that, if you look at it internally, it loosens India's social fabric. Because inevitably, most of the targets of mob lynching have come from a particular set of people, either from minority or even from Hindu society, they are coming from the marginalized sections. And since the victims of mob lynching inevitably come from selected few group of people, it always raises concern with respect to India's social fabric. It does not just end there, it has an economic component as well. An economic component is so, so significant because economy thrives at a place which has order, which has predictability, which has peace. And if the instances of mob lynching keep on happening at a particular place or in a particular society, it just reflects on its image as a total anarchical place. There is no there is no order in that particular place and hence the people would not like to invest at a place which frequently or even rarely observes mob lynching which means people do not follow the law and so it disrupts the functioning of the market and makes a section less confident to participate in the economy they would not want to go out of the place where they do not have much of their own types and so of course it raises concern with respect to the security as well rising instances of mob violence threaten internal security because mob lynching creates fractures in the society and the state and non-state actors which want to create trouble for india or any particular society they 
build upon this fracture and try to indoctrinate the youth and other people of that particular group which has been frequently subjected to the mob lynching apart from that when the cases of mob lynching go unpunished they create problem for law and order as well because obviously it reduces the authority of the police to act and it sows the seed of enmity which can become reason for further instability leading a law and order problem to become a public order problem and so it is important for us to dwell into the causes as well so one of the leading causes of mob lynching can be attributed to the prejudices which people garner on the basis of religion as well as on the basis of caste that this particular person belongs to this particular religion and so he or she has to behave in that particular way and not just that that particular behavior is antagonistic to my own interest and that is where the problem begins there is no problem in treating group of people a different from group of people b but when these two groups start to look at their interest at mu- as mutually exclusive and against each other that's when the problem begins and so when you look at the cases uh, related to cow vigilantism the killing of pehlu khan and tabrez ansari these are mostly related to that then the next set of cases have been motivated because of honor killings or shame killing which is the murder of an individual either an outsider or a member of family by someone seeking to protect what they see as the dignity and honor of themselves or the family so for example a couple from two different castes or from two different religions when they marry they are often killed by their near and dear ones even their first immediate family like parents as well because for them honor is more important than anything else in the world and so in india honor killings are often connected to religion to caste and other forms of uh, social stratification even in some cases to sexuality also because they have been uh, reported cases where people who were homosexuals were also killed now now honor killing is just not prevalent to our country but honor killing on the basis of caste is of course intrinsic to indian society because caste as an institution does not exist outside the indian subcontinent apart from that some of the but apart from that there are other reasons as well for example one of the culprit is our criminal justice system because people have felt since time long that the conviction rate from our judiciary is very very low and even when the convictions are finally made it takes decades for a criminal to be announced as a culprit and not just an accused and so this tarikh pe tarikh tarikh pe tarikh has led indian people in most cases belonging to rural areas to believe that unless and until they administer justice then and there the criminal will run free and there is no way to hold that person accountable and so best way to serve justice is to do it instantaneously through death without trial also increasing allegations of corruption against the police leads people to believe that if they do not dispense the justice then and there police is not going to take care of the criminal and may be release the accused on bail and they don't realize that bail is a matter of right in most of the cases and in recent years social media has emerged as one of the root causes behind the mob lynchings because in many of the cases as we have seen in the introduction it was revealed that the social media posts especially viral whatsapp forwards created an atmosphere of fear among the local people because of which they decided to take law in their hand and administer justice instantaneously and so it is important for the central as well as the state governments to take proper steps to prevent mob lynching because of its deleterious effect on society on economy on security as well as india's international relations but for that you need to realize that police and public order are state subjects under the seventh schedule to the constitution of india and the responsibility to maintain law and order and protect life and property rests with the respective state governments and so ministry of home affairs can at best issue advisory to the states and union territories from time to time to maintain law and order and ensure that any person who takes law into his or her hands 
is punished promptly as per law apart from that supreme court has issued guidelines on preventing mob lynching and so in this regard supreme court has issued guidelines against mob lynching which are basically a set of instructions for all the state governments that they shall first and foremost designate a senior police officer in each district for taking measures to prevent incidents of mob violence and lynching then they have to conduct vulnerability mapping that the state government shall immediately identify such districts subdivisions and villages where the instances of mob lynching and mob violence have been reported in the recent past or likely to occur in future then apart from that supreme court has said in the same guidelines that it shall be the duty of every police officer to cause a mob to disperse which in his opinion has a tendency to cause violence in the disguise of vigilantism or otherwise apart from that the central government and state government together should focus on awareness creation the central and state government should broadcast on radio and television and other media platforms including the official websites that lynching and mob violence of any kind shall invite serious consequence under the law and so you can see that if supreme court guidelines are clearly followed uh, the instances of mob lynching should decline drastically and so in the backdrop of rising mob lynching cases there is a growing concern within the civil society these concerns are compounded by the fact that due to the lack of specific law against lynching most of the time the perpetrators get away with most heinous crime and so now uh, voices in the civil society are coming together to propose a strict legislation against any such barbarism and so national campaign against mob lynching released a draft law known as manav suraksha kanun or acronymed as masuka which has laid the grounds for first defining what mob lynching is and as per the law lynching should be made a non bailable offense which means that bail should not be exercised as a matter of right apart from that if in a particular area mob lynching has taken place the station house officer should be immediately suspended because the station house officer should know that there is such an activity going on and should immediately respond and if particular sho has not been able to respond that person should not hold the office of sho and finally it prescribes life imprisonment for those convicted under mob lynching apart from that states like rajasthan manipur and west bengal have enacted their own law against mob mob lynching india wants to become a trillion dollar tourism economy by 2047 says kishan reddy now of course tourism just like any other sector of the economy is extremely important from the perspective of gs paper 3 and it becomes even more important when central government uh, at g20 tourism working group meeting in siliguri has envisioned making india a trillion dollar economy with 100 million international visitors by 2047 and if you look at tourism sector in india it currently accounts for 5% of the country's gdp and in the year 2019 and 20 that is just before covid struck us around 80 million people visited india and which created around 15% of the overall jobs in the country so you can see that around 1/6 of the jobs in our country are being created as a result of tourism and so it is extremely extremely important sector and hence we should first understand what are the types of tourism benefits the challenges which india still face and the steps taken by the government of india and so when we talk about tourism in itself is an economic sector and hence first benefit has to be about economic growth because tourism can contribute significantly to country's economic growth as it generates earnings and so it is just like export of a service because what is an export of service you provide some services to people abroad and you earn foreign exchange reserve similarly when people from outside foreigners come to india they spend they get their dollars converted into rupee and that is nothing but an export earning so the second point i have explained in the first and we know that creation of tourist spot creates so many jobs so for example if a destination a suddenly becomes a tourist spot you need a lot of things you need first and foremost airports railway stations or bus stations 
you need hotels you need restaurants and so you can see that tourism as an economic sector has such a huge multiplier effect as we have already understood that tourism can be a major source of foreign exchange earnings for india as it attracts a large number of foreign tourists who spend money on accommodation food transportation and other travel related expenses also the creation of tourist spots leads to infrastructure development and so there is a virtuous cycle a tourist spot develops it more people thrive it leads to infrastructure development and if you develop infrastructure on its own it leads to development of a place as a tourist spot so emphasis on tourism can definitely lead to construction and improvement of infrastructure such as roads airports and other transportation facilities which can benefit other sectors as well of course a lot of tourism comes from preservation of culture and heritage and so it leads to the preservation and promotion of rich cultural heritage by encouraging and preserving monuments arts and traditions after all people come to see what is unique and india apart from unique natural locations has a lot of unique cultural tangible and intangible heritages to offer to the global community economic growth combined with increased foreign exchange and infrastructure development of course leads to improvement in standard of living apart from that as more and more tourists flock to a particular location it increases the interaction and hence it helps promote understanding and awareness of different cultures traditions ways of life people and of course it provides international recognition so when we have so many uh, benefits of tourism it is also at the same time important for us to explore how many types of tourism has india has to offer to the world and so of course first and foremost india being a religious country and a birthplace of so many religions religious tourism is often the first one because uh, apart from prominent sites like ajanta ellora caves mahabalipuram hampi taj mahal hawa mahal char dham sanchi stupa which will mainly count as cultural heritage sites religious sites are also omnipresent in our country for example because india of course is a birthplace of not just hinduism but also buddhism jainism as well as sikhism and so most of the historical sites associated mainly with these four religions exist in india and so a buddhist anywhere in the world who is a practicing Buddh- buddhist and wants to go on pilgrimage she will definitely come to india apart from that india has a lot of opportunity for adventure tourism also because india offers opportunities for exploration of remote areas and for example lot of foreigners in recent past have taken up india for their trekking expeditions skiing in himalayas paragliding and rope ways apart from that india is bestowed with huge and immense coastline which have a lot of beautiful beach locations for example beaches of odisha are very very different from backwaters of kerala scuba diving in andaman and nicobar and coral watching in lakshadweep island and so india has a lot of diversity even within the beach tourism apart from that if you talk about environmental or eco tourism india has the potential to become a competitive eco tourism destination due to its abundant natural wealth india has so many different landscapes starting from uh, the himalayas snow clad mountains and glaciers passes various kinds of rivers desert in rajasthan plateau in southern india then deltas then islands so you can see that a person who wants to cherish diversity can come to india and can definitely find almost every landscape present in our country which is not the case with all the countries of the world by the way wildlife tourism of course we know that india has been very actively protecting wildlife through wildlife protection act 1972 and india's uh, wildlife protection uh, program has been quite successful in protecting a lot of species which were on verge of extinction and so asiatic lion tigers are well protected now cheetah also form the part of india's biodiversity now in last two decades india's uh, private sector private medical tourism has emerged as one of the leading earners of foreign exchange in last 10 to 20 years India avails cost effective but superior quality healthcare in terms of surgical procedures 
general medication and even ayurveda and yogic treatments similarly because of the increasing urbanization globally people earn for the rustic rural lifestyle and so some of the people also visit india just to see how villages are then india is also not able to completely exploit its uh, wide diversity for the benefit of tourism industry and one of the main reason that india is not being able to do that is because of the deficit in infrastructure although there is a rapid pace at which india is building upon its infrastructure but still there is a lot of deficit if you compare it with developed countries inadequate infrastructure and connectivity in terms of transportation and accommodation has been a major challenge for our country in fact absence of basic amenities like uh, even clean drinking water clean toilets first aid and good public transport has been one of the issues being faced by the tourists apart from that india's tourism is highly seasonal with most tourists visiting the country between october to march because most of the tourists come from uh, europe and usa where there usually is extra tropical climate which has usually much lower temperatures as compared to our country so only during the months of uh, october to march is the temperature bearable for them so unless and until they have some business purpose if the purpose is just tourism they would come or prefer only during the month of october and march but infrastructure once created has to be economical enough and so this creates of course a challenge for the industry to maintain or to make it economically viable throughout the year so earning has to be so high in 6 months or 4 months so that the businesses run for rest of the 7 to 8 months when the inflow is not that much also india's tourism sector faces a shortage of skilled workers particularly in areas such as hospitality and tourism management which obviously hampers the quality of service delivery to tourists apart from that the rapid growth of tourism industry has put a lot of burden on india's environment sustainability you feel this especially if you go to places like manali and shimla you will see that almost all the mountainous landscape is bustling with hotels and bars and restaurants and during the peak tourist seasons there is usually very long traffic jams which obviously pollute the environment raise the temperature locally leading to the melting so basically the lack of sustainable practices in the tourism industry has led to pollution basically plastic pollution overuse of water resources and hence decline of underground water and uh, damage to natural habitats as well apart from that india's cultural diversity which has attracted a lot of crowd which has acted like a crowd puller for the globe also sometimes create trouble because lack of sensitivity and understanding of cultural differences among tourists can lead to misunderstanding and hence conflicts and finally just like anything which has created hurdles bureaucratic hurdle is also one of the challenges facing the tourism industry because we still have to get permits licenses and other necessary paperwork and because of the corruption it takes a lot of time as well as resources to get one and only few people have access to that and so in this regard of course the government of india has taken a lot of steps for example for example initiatives like dekho apna desh swadesh darshan scheme a vibrant villages program all have been created to encourage tourism in border villages and to promote tourism within the country these schemes focus on encouraging middle class citizens to travel within country instead of going overseas also 2023 has been declared as visit india year which has been showcased under the g20 meeting as well which india hosted it is a program which invites the world to explore india and give impetus to tourism sector under this initiative more than 1 lakh foreign delegates who will visit india in 2023 will be showcased the entire gamut of india's culture including monuments and festivals apart from that government has decided to develop 50 new tourist destinations to attract more tourists across india the new destinations will be selected through challenge model considering critical factors like connectivity to the destination security facilities and the focus will be on developing a complete package keeping in mind the need of indian foreign tourists then scheme like amrit dharohar 
which has been announced to enhance biodiversity and support the optimum use of wetland has been created to promote ecotourism apart from promoting domestic tourism to promote local handicraft products all the states are encouraged to build unity malls at all prominent locations these malls will basically act as a place to display and sell states local speciality products manufactured and made and sold by the local artisans and finally building new airports and improving railway connectivity is uh, applicable in general for infrastructure development but would also definitely lead and give a big boost to tourism sector in our country